This is a meeting of the Northampton uh, Board of Health. Today is December 16th and it is 5.32. Uh, we'll start with public comment session. Um, if you would like to participate in public comment, um, please wave vigorously or use your electronic hand um, in the reactions uh, button. Um, and um, we don't seem to have a big crowd. So three minutes, please. Um, Suzanne, are you up for timing? Yes. Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to uh, present for public comment? I see one hand, Joanne. Chelsea Klein. Chelsea. Okay, go ahead, Chelsea. Can you, let's see, unmute. Good there evening, go. everyone. Hi, I'm Chelsea Klein. Um, I am here to uh, humbly beg you all to install a vaccine mandate for restaurants and bars. Um, there's a, been a petition going around in the past couple of days. I'm not sure if you saw, um, but we have over 300 signatures asking Northampton restaurants to have a, a, a vaccine mandate. Um, so a lot of cities are doing this um, and there's some you know, great clear language out there that's already being used and implemented that we could easily use in Northampton. Um, but I feel so torn as someone who loves local businesses and local restaurants that I want to go and patronize these places, but I don't feel comfortable going inside yet. Um, and it seems like now is the time as you were just talking about, you know, diminished capacity at hospitals with the with the new variants and everything that's happening that now is the time to really be, you know, stepping up our our requirements for our local restaurants and, and bars. Um, so that's what I wanted to say and, and please consider it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, let's see if we can get you to unmute. There you go. Oh, I'm unmuted. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. I also wanted to talk about the possibility of a vaccine mandate, and I'm here more to just plead on behalf of restaurant staff that the burden of this mandate and the burden of enforcement will fall on these employees. I'm already hearing stories about downtown um, retail employees who have spent this holiday season being berated by customers who are frustrated with mask requirements. Um, and so I think the more thought you can give around how enforcement will be handled, the more clearer your language might be, and the, um, the better job that you can do around publicity and sharing that burden to minimize um, what I suspect would be a lot of, um, at best, negative energy that might be felt by restaurant staff who are already under tremendous pressure and just trying to hang on, um, the better. So I just, again, would ask if you're gonna consider a vaccine requirement to also um, just keep in mind what the enforcement end looks like inside those small businesses. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on public comment? I don't see any other hands, anybody else? Thank you so much. Um, all right. Um, Tonight's meeting is being recorded. Um, and tonight we have Suzanne Smith, Cynthia Swopis, uh, myself, Joanne Levin. Laurent Levy is, uh, will be late. Um, and uh, would someone like to make a motion to open the meeting? Move to open the meeting. I'll second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne. Okay, so the Board of Health meeting is now open. Um, Meredith, um, the uh, a COVID update was put at the lower down on the agenda, yeah, but do you want we'll, to start with that? We'll start with that, most okay. certainly. Um, I It's hard to believe that we're going on year three of COVID-19. Um, when I think of that, it's just baffling to me that two complete years have gone by and we're entering the third year still doing this, uh, doing this work. So with that being said, um, you know, I know I understand firsthand that many people have COVID fatigue, are tired of it. I hear people say I'm done with it, but unfortunately COVID is not done with us. Um, and the, uh, the data proves that. To date, the total number of cases in Northampton is 2,050 cases. 
In the past 14 days, we've had 160 Northampton cases. That incident rate from 12-1 to 12-14 is 39 cases per day per 100,000. Now, if I compare that to the uh, incident rate at the peak of our last major surge, which was a year ago, and this peak was the first week of January, so after Christmas, and it was also inclusive of congregate care settings, long-term health care settings like nursing homes, our incident rate for 14 days at our peak was 32 cases per day per 100,000. So this 39 cases per day per 100,000 is alarming, but I also want to say it's not even capturing really what's happening out there in terms of community spread because we have a lot of people that are doing the at-home testing, which is a great strategy, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's not inclusive of our data sets because those at-home tests aren't reported into the state surveillance system. So, um, so that's humbling to, to say those numbers out loud and think about all the work that we have ahead of us. Um, the Omicron, Omicron variant has not yet been reported in, our, uh, in Northampton or our surrounding communities, but that doesn't mean it's not circulating. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you if you don't mind. We're gonna try this one more time. There we go. Mm, nope. Yep, it's happening. Starting. Yep. You got it. There we go. This is what I wanted. So, um, Omicron's in for um, many states so far. We have 43 cases in the U.S. I'm not sure we're looking at what you're looking at, though. Oh, darn. What are you looking at? Local public health COVID 19 update, December 16th press release. No. Do you want to choose a different uh, window to highlight? Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's from your Gmail. Yep. Let's look at this one. What are you seeing now? There's a map. There is a map. Okay. So two maps. So um, this is showing you the states presently um, where Omicron has been found. Here it was a week ago. So you can see that there is transmissioning transmission happening across the states. Um, the first 43 cases in the US, the earliest case was 1115. It was travel associated. Most cases reported are between 18 and 39 years of age. 33% of cases reported are from international travel. 80% were vaccinated, included 14 people with a booster. Most common symptoms are cough, fatigue, congestion. One person's been briefly hospitalized and there's evidence of transmission in the US. In uh, Massachusetts, well, I do have that. I put that down there. Um, in Massachusetts, we've had 16 cases reported to date. That doesn't mean there's not uh, more cases of Omicron. We only test about 30% of our samples sent to um, the state. The demographics is 10 female, six male, ages pediatric to 60s. Five of our cases have been fully vaccinated, including one with the booster dose. And it's been found in Essex, Middlesex, Suffolk, and Worcester counties. And none have been reported hospitalized as of yet. What we do know or what data is suggesting at this point is uh, that Omicron is very transmissible, more transmissible than Delta, 3.2 times more to cause a household infection, it's unknown if it causes more or less severe illness, unknown if our, uh, the efficacy of our vaccines, and unknown if monoclonal antibodies will maintain efficacy. So there's still a lot known. I think the next week uh, we'll be hearing a lot more about this. So with that being said, let's talk about vaccines. I'm going to unshare my screen. Hold on one second, stop share. Our vaccination rate here in Northampton, we're doing really good, we're above average. 89% um, of our Northampton residents have had one dose, 76% fully dosed. 
our vaccine clinic. We've done over 40,000 vaccines to date. We are uh, vaccinating five to six days a week. We're hosting uh, probably eight to 10 clinics per week. So we're doing multiple clinics uh, during one day. Um, three weeks ago, we still had appointments available at all of our vaccine clinics. Mm -hmm. Now you can't find um, a clinic, mm -hmm. uh, an appointment to get a booster shot. They are filling up really, really fast, um, which is great. People are coming to get their boosters, which is what we want people to do but they are very hard to find. We did just open up appointments for January. It was our plan to actually kind of scale back a little bit because my team is fried. Um, we aren't doing any vaccine clinics December 23rd through July, uh, excuse me, January 3rd. So we are getting some break, but we might have to revisit our scale back plan come January. Um, and DPH is, you know, begging LBOH to, to do booster shot clinics, which many of them are not doing. So we'll, we'll reassess, reassess that. But at this point, my team really needs a break. Everyone from the volunteers to the vaccinators, to the lead nurses, um, to the support staff. Um, we've been doing this almost a year now at warp speed. Um, on the testing front, we in Northampton are going to be opening up a PCR drive through walk up test site two days a week. We're going to be doing it. I'm partnering with Curative. Um, we're going to be testing Mondays and Fridays. I think the start date will be the 27th. We might hold off until G uh, January 3rd. We're just trying logistically to figure everything out. And it's going to actually be in the parking lot of where the health department is right across from the Peter Pan bus station. We have that nice loop right there, um, which is fantastic. Sorry. Um, East Stampton is doing uh, testing drive through model three days a week. So here in Hampshire County, that's five days a week that you're going to have PCR testing and they're using the same company curative, which is great because we were a uh, PCR test desert for a very long time if you were symptomatic, especially so it's really nice that curative is working with us and setting up these clinics. Um, Curative also has a seven-day-a-week clinic at the um, at the Holyoke Mall at the old right near the old Sears store, and they're there seven days a week from nine to five. So that's in addition to the Stop the Spread sites, which is fantastic. Um, the Stop the Spread sites you can find on mass.gov. I do often refer people to the two in Holyoke, one at HCC, the other one on Appleton Street. Um, they seem to you know, hardly have any lines and you get your test results pretty quickly. 24 to 36 hours is usually the turnaround time, which is fantastic. Meredith, and the clinics that are being run uh, by Curative, what computer, like how easy is it to access it? They, you just give them your name and your date of birth and then it comes on your phone, like how does so, that So, yep, I'll have links and QR codes and you'll be able to find those on our COVID website to register. And then it's a simple process if you don't pre-register, you, you don't have to pre-register. Um, so it's a simple process when you get there. And do those results, any positives go to you? Will they go into Mavis? They'll go into Maven, but they don't come to, I won't be able to see them like I did. I was able to get the results from the Broad the last time I brought testing into the community. I won't get the results first. I'll get them through Maven. Okay. Mm -hmm. How long a delay is there for that now? So they're saying up to 36 hours. Um, again, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, for us to get them. Mm -hmm. We've seen some delays and right now um, the system is pretty clogged because if they have more than 5,000 cases at one point, we can't get um, the data reports as needed. We actually have to go in and do individual pulls, um, which is a little tricky. Yeah, Maven was not um, designed for a pandemic. So we're, we, we've got some workarounds, but yeah. Yeah. And the, um, the, uh, Testing center at the Holyoke Mall at the old Sears. Is that active now? It is. It's been up for a couple of weeks now and it's a drive-through also. So you don't even have to get out of your car. 
project. And no, no appointment, right? No appointment necessary. Mm -hmm. And is Hampton active now or not yet? Yep, those are up and active. Okay. That is awesome. That's exactly what we've needed, more testing sites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> and then in addition to that, I don't know if you read, and I'm going to share my screen one more time. Let's see. Uh, um the city of northampton well on december 13th governor baker announced his plan to increase um at home test kits these are antigen test kits rapid test kits 15 minutes for results um we were one of the communities that have been identified that demonstrated the need so we've been given 5,000 test kits which um, there are two tests per kit so it equates to 10,000 tests in total um the this these are a little different if people are familiar with other uh, 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 test kits that have been distributed you don't need to report your results they're not asking for that so there's no uh, mobile phone or no com computer that's needed for these test kits anyone two years of age or older can use these which is fantastic I just included the 102 communities that are getting the kits um so um, there, the distribution, us being a distribution center are, and let me see if I'm just gonna skip this one. No, I'll keep it there. Um, it, it, these are great. These are a great public health strategy to fill in the gaps um, for, you know, for testing where people have issues for access to testing, maybe transportation is a barrier. Um, it's, you know, for, they're asking us to get these test kits out to the most vulnerable population, um, the high risk populations for severe disease, um, low income families. I know that they have these type of home test kits in the pharmacies, but I hear they're kind of expensive. Um, Kelly is actually going to do a search for me tomorrow to see if the pharmacies indeed are carrying them, how much, and if insurance is covering them. So we're trying to prioritize how we distribute these test kits. Um, and, you know, 5,000 seems like a lot, but it really isn't. So I've already been in touch with Lee Anderson from MANA um, Soup Kitchen, who also has the Resource Center. So I'm going to be giving him a thousand of these kits on Monday, and he's going to use them for those people who utilize the Resource Center because people can be in this small congregate setting for hours at a time. He'll hand them out at um, at at um, at dinner. Um, and however he sees fit. So I feel like he's got um, his really a pulse on the high risk populations. A lot of people seek him out for services. So he'll be great at helping us distribute the test kits to those that really need them. Also, um, I've been in contact with Heidi Norton Smith, I believe is her last name, over at um, the Survival Center. She's going to be a distribution center for those people that use the Survival Center. Ste uh, Pastor Steph at First Churches is going to help distribute them. <laughs> I'm going to, I've reached out to um, Elliott House for Homeless Services. So they're the people who are actually like the boots in the ground, do outreach to our um, uh, uh, the um, unsheltered population. Um, so they'll, they can hand them out that way. And who else? The, the, I've been in touch with uh, ServiceNet to see if they needed any for the cot shelter, for James House, and for the interfaith shelter. So we're really trying to be mindful how we distribute these kits. We just, we don't, um, one thing I really don't want to be is the health department be a distribution center for, um, you know, handing out kits on a one-to-one -one basis. That just doesn't seem like we don't, they're really meant for people that are of lower income, don't have access, um, and we just don't have the means to do any type of verification for that. So we're really going to rely on the agencies that work with people that fall under that those parameters. Um, if we do end up keeping some after I figure out who's getting how many, then we'll have to figure out a way to, to hand them out. But anyways, it is a great um, public health tool really, really important, but it's important to note that it's not a diagnostic test. 
these are not accepted to um, return to work or school if you've been asked to um, quarantine or isolate, obviously. They're not accepted for shortening a quarantine period following any type of exposure. I do believe they're not accepted for travel. Um, and I think most places don't allow these types of tests for vaccine requirement testing exemptions. So there is a place for them, but again, they're not replacing any other public health strategies that we have, meaning vaccines, meaning masking indoors, meaning still social distancing, and staying at home when sick. We often have talked about that Swiss cheese model. Over the past two years, we're just trying to fill up that hole by layering different public health strategies on top of it. This is one of those layers. Meredith, you know what, what brand of uh, test kit the state will be giving you? I certainly do. I th it's called iHealth Labs at Home Antigen Test. And another question is, uh, if we have homeless folks who test positive, do we have uh, access to uh, hotel rooms for them? So um, they still have the isolation and quarantine hotel in Eastern Mass, and they have transportation available six days a week. Um, we just have to make a phone call. But there's nothing out at this end of the state? There's not, nor do I think they're going to open up something on this end of the state. That's always been a struggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last surge, they did have one in Eastern Mass and in the Berkshires, but I haven't heard if the Berkshires one is open. It, it's also my understanding that some of these um, test kits, you know, there's they're a little tricky and it's like um, you, you can't keep them in the cold for too long I, and you have to make sure it gets to room temp before you use it. So that leads me to believe as we distribute that as as some of these agencies distribute the test kits, I guess all we're doing is keeping our fingers crossed and hope that people are reading the instructions. So yeah, the instructions um, aren't awesome and they're only in English. I do believe there's an infographic now on the state website with many different languages, but I also think that, right, that's just how to do the actual test. I come up with a one pager that I'm going to distribute um, to the people that are gonna be handing them out so they can then give that um, with the test. That'll be okay. more helpful Good. information about, you know, keeping them at room temperature and, and how to use them properly, not in terms of swabbing, but, you know, as a tool. Joanne, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Meredith. That's all great news in, in a way. <laughs> if we have to have news on our pandemic, it's good that we have more tools available to us. Um, that is great. Hi, Laurent. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, can someone Thank make Laurent? Can someone make Laurent a co-host? I'm good. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for being late. Not a problem. Can, can I just ask a question um, um, based on the, the COVID report? Um, did, I don't even know how to ask the question because at this time last year it was a very different situation and the whole town was closed and now we're open and people are vaccinated. And yet these rates are so alarming, even with a high vaccination rate. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I hope at some point we have a discussion about, um, you know, I know masks are on the agenda constantly, but also some of the things that we heard in public comment. I, I don't, I'm not advocating for any one way or another right now until I see more data and science, but I hope we're able to have a discussion about mandates again, or, or if that's completely off the table. I just, I just want to raise it because it was raised uh, certainly in public comment and, and what it would take to do that. And if that's the Mm -hmm. the route we'd want to go. And if there's any other community that has put a mandate on restaurants that in, in Massachusetts, does anyone know? I don't know, but Cynthia, I put um, the Massachusetts electronic vaccination documentation on the agenda as a takeoff point to discuss how we might use that documentation. Great, thanks. Um, 
So um, can we do old business first? Um, so I thought we'd like to go, I'd go back to the indoor mask mandate. Does anyone have anything they want to edit or comment about the mask mandate? Um, personally, I feel we should keep it in place. Um, Meredith, are you finding that there are any holes in it or anything that needs um, fixing, amending in that? Uh, I honestly think we should start discussing um, food service establishments. Um, there's a lot of people standing, commingling, and not wearing their mask because they have a drink in their hand. Um, and that's kind of alarming to me. And I know we brought attention to this when we wrote the mask mandate. Um, but again, with community transmission rates so high, I think it's time to revisit it and start thinking about that. And what does that look like? And even if it's just, you know, temporary um maybe start thinking about language that you know masks must be worn in food service establishments except for when seated i don't know i know you're that. thinking you think it's the standing around mingling as opposed to being seated with your group yeah. um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i know that is a huge impact on bars so i think we really need to think about it be very mindful of it um i believe some holiday gatherings are planned for some of the bars and restaurants downtown just an alert that that might be coming up in the next couple of weeks yeah i i think maybe you know i think maybe the stronger message is for people just not to you know go to large indoor gatherings at this point. I, I think that's going to be more effective than anything. Like just, I don't know how many times I can say it. And it's, it's, it's hard because I know it's the holidays and people want to get together with their families. Um, but there's also large events that are happening, you know, outside of family gatherings and they might be political events or um, I, I don't know, just, holiday celebrations or music yeah, I mean, events and that first night is happening i mm -hmm. mean i i just it's it just seems to me like we've <laughs> i know it's fatigue but it's like we're ignoring things and i don't know how to um other than us making a policy that really sort of alerts people i don't know how else to get this word out because uh this is just going to continue I, I, I feel like I, I'm not hearing these strong numbers, case numbers, um, like we were a year ago. Like it's just background noise and, and nobody's really paying attention. So maybe, you know, for the next nine days, like we really just have to be loud and get that message out there and, and, and say it to as many people on many, as many platforms as we can. Like, we're in a far worse place than we were a year ago. I mean, the hospitalizations, I know Joanne have been down, but they're going back up. They are, they are going mm -hmm. back up. And I actually looked today um, at how many, and uh, today we had 12 patients with COVID in the hospital and that's the highest we've been in, you know, a year or whatever. Mm -hmm. Five of them had no vaccine. Three had only one shot or under vaccinated, two had, um sorry yeah um sorry five had no vaccine three had only one vax um four had a full series um and none of the patients in the hospital had boosters so um my suspicion is that boosters will be you know protective tony fauci today said that you know um having two mrna vaccines protected against symptomatic disease 35%, um, which is really low, but that wasn't really the goal of the vaccines is to keep people out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and so if transmission, um, and, and he said 75% for people who are boosted. Um, so transmission definitely is curtailed um, to a good extent um, by the booster. Um, and I think there's more and more um, information out from the scientists that are saying it's very likely that um, even with Omicron, that 
being fully vaccinated, especially with a booster, will protect against hospitalization and death. Um, so what I think we're seeing or about to see is a, a discordant rise in cases and not quite as many hospitalizations, but clearly an increase in hospitalizations and mm -hmm. the number of them in the ICU. Um, but the numbers of cases will probably rise faster than the number of hospitalizations. They won't be synchronous. That's, mm -hmm. that's my guesses of where we're going. Um, I'm very disappointed uh, that the state is not taking a stronger stand. I mean, what was really amazing um, was at the beginning of the pandemic that uh, Governor Baker took a stand and closed restaurants and bars and schools and 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 really did a dramatic um, moves that we needed to have. Um, and I don't think there's a political will to do that now. Um, we certainly are are in a different place in that many people are vaccinated. So it's a it is a little bit different. But not only are they taking a stronger stand, they're actually um taking lesser of a stand than they should be. We mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. the CTC, which were the state contact tracers. <laughs> um, they stopped taking cases, new cases as of 1130, which I told you on the last Board of Health meeting. And then um, let me just, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen with you one mm -hmm. more time. I wanna show you what, uh, I mean, sorry, it's gonna make you dizzy for a second. Um, this is what we've been told about doing our case investigations and contact tracing. So beginning now, DPH and local health departments can prioritize their case investigation and contact tracing, um, specifically settings with vulnerable populations. Um, so like, you know, long-term healthcare facilities, congregate settings such as shelters, corrections, um, schools, higher education, so on and so forth. But they are saying not every case or close contact needs to be reached. Like that just, I feel it almost undermines, you know, the work that we've been doing. Um, we will continue on the course that we've been on. If we have the resources, we're gonna most certainly try to reach every, at least, every positive case, um, you know, a month ago, EPH said the positive case can then reach their contacts, but we were still doing their contacts. We obviously don't have the bandwidth to be doing all of it, but we are mm -hmm. still gonna stay the course and do contact tracing and case investigation to the best of our ability, the way that we've been doing it. Um, so it just, it kind of, it's baffling to me being in the situation where we are with, you know, community transmission happening the way it is and, you know, we're not getting the support that we need. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Meredith, is it still true that <clears throat> people who are vaccinated with a primary series do not need to quarantine? Yes. So, but you you would do contact tracing, but not quarantine. Yeah. So, if you were exposed and you're vaccinated, um, the recommend you don't have to quarantine. But these are our recommendations: is um, you have to monitor your symptoms for symptoms for 14 days. Um, we strongly recommend that you get tested on day four, or day five, and then again on day 12. Um, now that's kind of the overall guidance that we give. Of course, it could look, it could be a little nuanced depending on the setting that we're talking about. And people who test positive still need to, um, whether they're vaccinated or not, still need to isolate for 10 days. For 10 days, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So do you um, have any thoughts about language um, about bars and restaurants or you wanna think about that? Anybody? In terms of- um, Well, for uh, masking, for masking, just start. 
Are you suggesting that you want to amend the existing order or simply make some sort of recommendation that get sent to businesses in some fashion? It's up to you. I mean, I, I feel at this point, if we can just <laughs> be really loud and, you know, start with our public health messaging, be heard, and maybe ask the restaurants to really kind of um, enforce this recommendation, start there and see what happens. Maybe that's the way to go. I, I mean, I hate the financial impact, you know, that it could have on our restaurants or, um, and our bars, especially. So maybe doing both, we can do a mass emailing and a mass um, mass mass correspondence um, about you know we really need your help at this time to get through you know the other side of the surge. I'm afraid things will start closing down just because they're not going to have enough employees to you know run their business or mm -hmm. patrons to go. This is it could be crippling. I do think if we're going to do public health messaging, um, I think it would be important to say that high risk activities include going to a, a restaurant, going to a bar. These are all been established as high risk activities um, for transmission. And I think there are some people who believe if they're legally open, then it means that they're safe. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah. It's, it's inappropriate messaging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's two messages. It's to the business owner, the restaurant owner, and then it's to the public that um, that um, frequents them. And you know, either way, it's it's a threat to the business. Either way, because we're going to say to the public, "You better not do that. <laughs> you better not go there." And um, I, I just don't know how we can get around that. Um, uh, you know, I just. I'd hate to see us tiptoe around it. I mean, I, I think of, um, you know, a potential letter to businesses and in the light of the new information that we have, it's almost, um, it's a little too, hey, would you please kind of sort of, we'd love to have you. Um, I think it might need to be stronger, much stronger. And I'm not suggesting a threat that might come down the line, but um, I just, um, it just doesn't seem like people are taking it seriously. Or, or is there the feeling that, hey, I think I'm going to get sick, but at least now I won't get as sick? Is that, is that giving some people relief? I, I just don't know. I, th I think there might be a sense that there's a new variant. Um, it's got some sort of, um, the vaccine has some diminished efficiency. And at that point, the reasoning may be, um, well, what is the next step? Do we mask forever? Do we booster each other in six months? I mean, there's a bit of a, a realization that uh, we may never be out of this for a number of months, or at least at least this winter. But And that makes me hesitant to do something that uh, ultimately is, um, I don't know to the extent it's going to be listened to. And I'm, I'm taking the perspective because I sit here, I'm in Ohio right now, and people wearing masks is in the very, in the minority. And it gives me pause. It's like the variant has not occurred in people's mind. So I feel that in some way we're in, the, in, the, in a bubble. And uh, living in that bubble I found it overwhelmingly complicated to, uh, to control our environment. I'm not saying we can't message to remind people to get masks, but I, I'm not convinced there's a very strong message we can do. And I'm not inclined to shut bars and restaurants, not on my watch. So I, I don't know exactly how to approach this, very honestly beyond stronger messaging, but with a little bit of pessimism about it. As was mentioned in public comment, um, in a way, 
bars and restaurants are currently the site of pitched battles over masking. Um, once again, we've made it the responsibility of the owners and employees to enforce the mandate that we have imposed. And people are pushing back. Um, and I say that thinking that it's, it's already a difficult situation. Enforcement is already difficult with what we've already imposed. That's not to say that something else isn't warranted, but it's, I think we need to be aware of the fact that we're not talking about this um, over virgin soil. That this has been, people have been operating in this space for a long time and they have their habits and they have their choices and they have their beliefs. Um, and this is what we still have as far as transmission. So when we talk about our public health messaging, um, Meredith, what, what is our vehicles? I mean, we have a potential letter to all business owners um, and, and that's one audience. Um, I'm not sure how we get information out to everyone else. Mm -hmm. We always mention the Gazette, but I think that that's a, um, you know, one vehicle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see a couple uh, news reporters on Zoom today. Hopefully they can help. They're picking yep. up some talking points that they can put out there for us. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that, um, I don't know, Meredith that put out a press release and send it to the news, newspapers, whatever, but to be really clear and specific um, about what the risks are um, and uh, because I think, you know, all these articles I read say, oh, when the holidays, be careful. I was like, that's not specific enough. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're going to gather with people outside your household, particularly those who are vulnerable, or if you are vulnerable yourself, see if you can get a home antigen kit, wear a mask, you know, don't eat. You can maybe gather and not eat because taking, when you eat, you take off your mask. I mean, I think we can really be more practical in the messages we give or that eating in a restaurant is risky because you take off your mask and if they don't have good ventilation. I mean, there's a lot of detail that we could put out there. Um, but, you know, people are still gonna make their own choices and the people who are at highest risk are not going to restaurants right now. Um, so I guess the question is, do we, give people the information and let them, let them make their own choices um, or do we sort of mandate businesses? Um, I think mandating is a hard thing to do right now. Um. I, I, I hear you, Joanne, and I'm, I'm inclined to message, but certainly not change the type of mandating that we do. So how do you wanna proceed on our indoor mask Mandate as written, anything? Have, having not reviewed it recently, but Meredith, you were talking about the standing around without masks um, versus uh, seated at a table, having a meal or right. a drink. Right, um, we didn't include that language. It was in the original mask order and it was in the governor's order that you had to wear your mask unless you were seated. And we didn't include that when we wrote the mask order back in August. So I was just bringing that um, mm -hmm. to light. And Is there how, a reason? How, yeah, how would that affect businesses? Um, can you imagine there are particular businesses where that would not work or what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, the bars. It wouldn't work for the bars because people are standing and drinking and they don't have a lot of seating. And is that why we didn't include them in our um, August um, policy? I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Anybody have um, a proposal or no proposal? So we were, the, the, the state recommended we do that, but we chose not to? No, the state way back when um, the first policies came out. Yeah, the, go, the state no. has yeah. no state of emergency currently and no yeah. mask mandate. And Baker said today he would not right. even mm -hmm. consider a mask mandate. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe perhaps, you know, the board making an, a recommendation at this point is the way to go. Keep the mandate the way it is. Make a recommendation. To the bars, you mean? Mm -hmm. to, the, to the food service establishments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A recommendation um, that they um, they ask their customers to be masked and less seated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since the uh, mask mandate was publicized at all. Would it be of value to give another push to let people know what is already policy? Um, just because we remember it and review it every month doesn't mean that it's right at the fingertips of, of people that are living their lives downtown and other places. Um, just a reminder during this holiday season when, when people are eager to gather together um, that these are the policies for um, indoor spaces in Northampton. And with the rise in cases, it's even more important to adhere to these measures now. Mm -hmm. I like it, Suzanne. I think I'd like to also see in public messaging comments about the type of mask that people wear and that the cotton mask were a stopgap measure in the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't have enough surgical masks or N95s that, that really cotton masks are not appropriate anymore if people have access to KN95s or N95s. Maybe my workday experience is, is different, um, but I, I have these interactions about masking all day long with people in a healthcare setting. And um, many of what we think are obvious statements about differences in masking and things like people have that those subtleties are absolutely lost on people. A mask is a mask. Um, I don't like it over my nose, so I won't wear it over my nose. Um, you didn't say I had to wear it over in this corner. It does say on the door that you have to have it on inside, but I'm sitting over in this corner. So that means I don't have to have it. I mean, these are the, these are the, the, the behaviors I see demonstrated all day long, even though there's signage, there are people reminding people it's, it's, it's repeated visits and repeated interactions. And the behavior doesn't seem to change very much. Um, I think, I don't know if it's fatigue. I don't know if people are locked into their model and what they're comfortable with or what they're actually willing to do. Um, but even in face-to-face -face interactions, I have found it very, very difficult to change people's behaviors. And that's just my experience. Yeah, I think the reality on the ground um is not ideal, um, but I think as the Department of Health, uh, I think it's our job to educate best we can and tell people best practice. Um, no argument with that. I, I just want to, I, I need to temper my expectations of, mm -hmm. of impact based on, on the experiences I'm, I continue to have. So it sounds like from our discussion, we don't want to change the mask mandate at this time, but we do want to put out a statement um, requesting that the food establishments um, encourage people to mask when they're standing and only to unmask when they're seated with their group. Um, does that sound, sound right? 
Meredith, you good with that? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't think we need to vote on that. Um, Meredith, if, a, Meredith if, if I can remember what I said a minute ago, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll send it to you in a text. I, mean, I shared it in the meeting and I don't think we have to vote on it, but I'll, I'll try to remember what I said. That would be great. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and also for, for the public to know about this as well, not just the um, business owners. Thank you, Amy. Um, the vaccine requirement at the senior center, I think that's been publicized. Uh, at least I've seen it on Northampton Neighbors and um, around. Um, I know that we said the definition of vaccinated was to have one J&J or two mRNA vaccines. Um, but I'm feeling pretty strongly that um, if the goal of the vaccine mandate was to decrease transmission at the senior center, then we should change our definition to include um, uh, booster dose for those who are eligible. Um, and I think we did mention that to Marie when she was here that that was coming. Um, the CDC has not changed their definition yet. Some of the colleges have. Um, and I think the CDC will be changing their definition. Uh, it just seems like timing wise, um, it hasn't gone into effect yet. And we're about to have a huge surge, um, I, I suspect. Um, so I, I'm feeling like we should make that change in this policy. Um, any thoughts about that? I would agree. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree too. It's just with the effective date being the 17th, I don't think that would um, give enough time for people to get the booster if they were eligible. I think that would be problematic because mm -hmm. there's just, there's no appointments right now. Well, they're very mm -hmm. limited. Mm -hmm. We could make the effective date of the change a little later. Um, be unfortunate because this is right. Month of January is going to be the crunch time, right? That's going mm -hmm. to be our surge time. Mm -hmm. And I'd hate to delay the policy yeah. mm -hmm. for this. So if there's some internal way of like, okay, you can come in now, but um, the booster must, you must have the booster by such and such a date. Right. Yeah. The other option is to say, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the elders are boosted. Those who are not boosted just can't come for a few more weeks until they get their booster. I don't know. Could go either way on that. Um, Meredith, you have I, you've presented um, wonderful data on the high proportion of those 65 and older in Northampton being vaccinated. Do you have a, a handle on how many have a booster? Mm -hmm. Mm, I don't. That, that, I mean, if it's if it's a small proportion, I, I have no idea. But small proportion, then that's going to be a, a big hurdle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm sure I could extrapolate that, um, but I don't have it right now. Uh, and and I think people were that that supported this were very eager for it to be put in place so they could in fact go back to the senior center and to put another barrier up now uh, i think would be confusing and discouraging for people uh, not that it's it, it's certainly worthwhile as a, as an aspiration but to change the goalposts move the goalposts now um, i think would confuse the situation so we could um, amend the definition and have that start date be a later date, something like that. I, I didn't hear you, Joanne, and that start date what? Be a later date than the original date is uh, in effect January 17th, and we could pick, I don't know, three weeks later or something would be the start date of a new definition. Can we wait to see how we're <laughs> able to roll out boosters um, over the next month or so, we can always change the definition that the, the trick is how people can achieve that in a timely manner. Right. 
I'd, I'd really hate to hate change that date. That sends a whole different message. No, not change the date of the, of the policy as is it written, but to sort of add on that as of February something, a booster would be required. Okay. Not to not to undo what we've done. Just I wouldn't know what date to pick based on the availability of boosters. Yep. And I think in all fairness, we should have this as an agenda item on the next Board of Health meeting so mm -hmm. people have an opportunity to speak about it mm -hmm. during public comment session. And so we, we could ask Marie, um, I'm not sure how she's decided to uh, operationalize this, um, but we need her input as well. Uh, our next meeting would be on the 20th. So that will have given Marie only three days to reflect on her mandate. <laughs> well, we, she would have it in place. You know, yes. whatever operations she has for that would already be in place. Mm -hmm. 20th, is that right? Um, okay, um, anybody do you want to um, put that on? We'll have this on the agenda again uh, next month and maybe invite Marie um, to either discuss it with you, Meredith, in the meantime, or come to the meeting either way. Great. Um, under old business, um, public edu education, publicizing board of health recommendations. Um, Laurent uh, wrote a letter, which um, I have to look at. Where is that letter? Came from Kelly on 1214. Does everybody have that? I, I have it in my documents. So. Has everybody had a chance to look at that? I'm just trying to look at it in light. I, I looked at it and now we have this conversation this evening. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see if there was opportunities to make it stronger. Mm -hmm. Meredith, do you have that available uh, to share? It came from Kelly on the 14th. Um, I don't. It's no, not on this computer. Okay. <laughs> I don't want the funky Zoom thing to happen if I go into my, my desktop. Do you want me to try to share? Sure. Let's see. Don't know if I can do that. Mm, I have no idea. As co-host, you should be able to share your screen. But it's not showing me. It's not showing me my documents. Open system preferences? Hmm. Someone else able to do that? I'm going to try. Anybody see anything? No. <laughs> mm. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try one more time. Oh, it's a different document. Um, oh. oh, yay. Okay. There you go. I think that's mine. Yep. Or is it yours? And let's not fight over it. <laughs> no, that's yours. Can you scroll up a little bit or show the whole document? I'm not sure. <clears throat> Do 
to about as tight as I can get it. Maybe we'll, make it a little smaller with the little okay. slider on the bottom there. Yeah, you, you go. can you can otherwise there's a little bit um, the little arrow at the top. Can do you see this ribbon? Keep going up, up and to the right, to the right. Yep. To the right, completely to the right of your screen. Further to the right. Yep. Yeah. This this press this. No, under this little uh, carrot. This little uh, no 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 go back up. <laughs> There's a little tiny arrow, a little carrot at the top of that top section, the bottom of the top section. Bottom of the top section. Is this it? No no no. Go back up. There's a little uh, arrow further up, further up. Go to the arrow. Now go back down a little bit. Down. Oh, you may be seeing something that I'm not. That's why I can't follow you. Oh. oh, so it's at the very end. If you look at the line, do you see reuse files, right? Oh, I, I didn't Under, because there was something oh, okay. over it and I took that out. Okay. So now go all the way to the right to the yep. end. At, um, Got it. Here, yeah, press yeah. it. Yeah. Full screen mode. That's what I couldn't see. Any better? Yes. Oh, there you go. Thank nice. you. <laughs> um, I think in the third line, I would. Uh, it says the board encourages. I would make that a little stronger. Strongly. Such as? Strongly encourages. Ur urges. Uh, urges. Thank you, Suzanne. There, there's, there's language through here that. Um, Gives, and this is no no offense, Lauren. Just, just it, it appears to me to be too polite. <laughs> Would you please? <laughs> yes, yes. I am not. I'm not. A, I'm not offended. I, I I started by low bidding because I knew you would upbid me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like we're in the midst of a pandemic with a huge surge, a high highest number of cases since last April. Could you please consider? <laughs> You know, I think that the, the urgency of the situation needs to be conveyed a little bit more and the importance of these measures even more now. I, I don't think people recognize that these measures are still e even more important than they were before. So instead of working on this right now, would you be okay if uh, Meredith and I worked on this and put a, a stronger version of this out? Sure. Of course. Sort of, I mean, personally, of course, that's- that Or if sense. Lawrence, if you and Meredith want to work on it or however you want to do it, but two of us can't do it without it being a, a, a meeting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with anything that you, you do with it. It's the draft to get started. It's the intended for someone else with another pair of eyes to go through it and to emphasize the message or add to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to relinquish this draft. Mm -hmm. Joy, my personal opinion is that I would be certainly comfortable with you working on it and sending it as a letter as the chair of the board. Okay. Um, um, that, that, I don't know how the others feel, but I'm comfortable with that. That's a, a great suggestion, uh, Suzanne, because I think we, you know, like Joanna and Meredith, you've heard our, the discussion and, you know, we all agree it has to be stronger. <laughs> and we, we could add a little more of data in there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, put little sections in there about masking, vaccination, where to get a booster. Um, various things. Um, yes, thank you so much, Lauren, for drafting this. Uh, it definitely is helpful to have something to start with. Um, I'm happy to work on that if that's what you want. When I send this, do you want your names on it or just my name? Or on my name on me on behalf of the Board of Health. Does that sound reasonable? I have no problem with my name, but it's whatever folks want. I, I, I'm comfortable with my name too. Um, I, I, do we have to vote on that? No. Okay. Lauren? I'm, I'm comfortable if you use my name. Okay. I will uh, work on it and run it by Meredith and um, then we'll put that out as soon as, as soon as I can. 
Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, one piece of other piece of old business um, is, which I just sent out today, thank you, Kelly, for sending it out, was that, um, do you remember that we uh, formally approved um, House Bill 926, an act relative to improving pesticide protections in Massachusetts school children. Um, they wanted written testimony and the, and the hearing happened, I think this past Tuesday, um, but they still, I think would be happy if we sent written, um, a written request. And I don't know if, if you've had a chance to look at this, this was language that they sent to us as sample language. Um, would you be okay if we sent this from our board with changing from the school committee to the board of health? Um, and sending this to the committee, the hearing committee, um, and also to Speaker Mariano and Representative Sabadosa and Comerford. Um, I remember the, the meeting where we discussed this. We didn't vote at that point on any language to be submitted in, in um, I mean, we voted in favor of it. And there was, I thought there was language that was presented or discussed at that meeting. Did we not vote at that time to support this with language? I don't remember any language. Meredith, do you remember? I don't, we'd have to look back in the minutes. This language is pretty sort of benign. It's a whereas children oh. absorb more pesticides relative to their body weight, things like that. Uh, that there's a bill currently um, in the state legislature. Um, this bill has been filed by these representatives and with Western Massachusetts representatives as well and the other organizations that will support this bill. So it, it's, it's pretty straightforward, I'd say. It wouldn't, um, hurt, and, to, wouldn't hurt to send it again. Like, yeah, that doesn't I don't hurt. know if we used this language before. So the part that um, is sort of the statement of intent is the last paragraph that says resolved that the committee, our committee supports H926, urges number two, urges the Massachusetts House of Representatives to bring this bill to a vote and three, sends a letter of support to Mr. Mariano and Sabadosa and Comerford. Um, so as long as you're okay with those three actions, um, then I, I think it's reasonable to send this. Does everybody feel okay about that? I mean, we've already voted to support the, the bill. I'm good with it, yep. Laura, Suzanne? Yeah, so I, I sent uh, emails to the principals under my own name. I did, I did identify myself as a member of the Board of Health. So I would uh, just submit this with, instead of, uh, it's written as a school committee, but as a Northampton Department of Health. Right. Board of, Board of Health. Laura, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do we need a vote or we just, this is just. Um, this is a formality. I think we've already voted to support the. the so bill. if I recall the vote was to endorse the bill, but there yes. was no language. I don't remember any specific language. And I don't think we ever submitted anything mm -hmm. written. So this would be yep. the submission. Okay, thank you. Um, new business. I wanted to just um, talk about the fact that uh, Massachusetts will soon have an electronic vaccination documentation availability. Um, I think that will come from MIAS. Um, from the state and then um, it turns into a QR code um, so that that can be shown on a phone or on paper um, to uh, an establishment that's checking vaccination records. Um, Meredith, do you any more, know any more detail about that? I don't have any update on that. I know like certain companies, like if you got your vaccine at Walgreens for, for instance, they use Smart Health which mm -hmm. is a QR code that brings up, that taps into the MIS system that brings up um, your name, your um, your vaccination state, uh, the status, and I think maybe your date of birth, but no other medical information is on there. Um, I'm hoping soon that the state will adopt something very similar. 
to that and, and release it, but I haven't gotten an update since we spoke about it last. It's on the, it's in the horizon. Yeah, so Governor Baker says it'll be available soon and we yeah. have no idea what soon means. We didn't hear that um, for months. <laughs> but, but I have to say, I just, um, I'll admit that I just traveled. I went to Puerto Rico and in order to go, get into Puerto Rico, you had to either show your vaccination status or have a test. And um, before going, we had to fill out travel forms online and they gave us a QR code. So I had a little mm -hmm. QR code on my phone. I showed it to them when, and we entered at the airport and we were done. It was actually very amazing. Um, so, um, so with that was going to be my question of, do we want to encourage businesses to use that when that comes? Um, or you know, that was gonna be my takeoff for the question for the group uh, about uh, vaccine requirements for certain establishments. Actually, the question for you, Meredith, um, as is often my question for you is, are you seeing clusters in particular places other than within families? Yes. Um, and can you disclose not the exact places, but the types of places? Businesses, <laughs> um, uh, corrections, um, yeah, they're everywhere. Schools, it's everywhere. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, though, the CDC did study, uh, you know, what were risk factors and being in a restaurant was a risk factor. Going to a gym was a risk factor. Are you still seeing that as well? Again, they're super hard to identify. You know, the index case, um, just some of the clusters that we've had over the past three weeks are so large that we're able to connect those dots. And us now having um, uh, 17 different communities data is allowing us to connect the dots a little more local on a local level, which is pretty awesome because that's really one of the uses that we were we were hoping that we'd be able to um, you know dissect data better um, having that. But yeah, it's it's still hard. But because some of the clusters are so big, um, we can connect the dots. I don't know if that answered your, your question, Joanne. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me one more time. Um, so can we identify clusters? Well, you have oh. identified big ones and mm -hmm. obvious ones, but mm -hmm. I guess, um, yeah, in order to identify, I mean, if people develop COVID and they haven't seen a relative or a person that they know that they got it from, the you know, I don't know if your nurses have time to ask, you know, have you gone to a gym? Have you gone to a restaurant? Have you, you know, traveled? <clears throat> that kind of stuff. So, you, right? Mm -hmm. The questionnaire, it, we've had to skim it down. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. people's lives are so big. That's true. It didn't used to be that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so any other comments or proposals? So in the letter that goes to the public and to um, Restaurants or eating establishments, do we want to say we encourage, we've already said we encourage their employees to be vaccinated. Uh, do we want to encourage um, that they have vaccination as a um, requirement for entry like they do in New York City? Any thoughts about that? Um, th this is something that I, I would support um, we are falling back on our discussion that we have regarding the senior center, which is what do we mean by vaccinated? Um, are we immediately saying vaccinated and boosted? Uh, which is going to get a pushback or are we saying vaccinated? 
um, which are we thinking that there's still some limited effective, effectiveness here? Uh, and, and is it, should, should we go one more step and, and suggesting boosted? And if it's suggesting boosted now, are we a little too early here? And should we wait until our next meeting? I, I'm asking, I'm not necessarily against not doing anything. I'm just uh, floating these questions. I think it's inevitable that boosting is going to become part of the definition, don't you, don't you folks who are closer to this? Yes. Like, uh, like appropriately so, yeah. Yeah, imminently. <laughs> I also want to just kind of bring this up. I mean, I, I want the information that I'm pushing out to the businesses to be almost bullet point and maybe one small thing underneath that bullet to substantiate it because it's not going to get read. Like yeah. it'll get lost. The message will get lost. So if we can really kind of identify two or three real important public health strategies that will help their businesses to remain open, like kind of put the emphasis on that. Um, Maybe that's what we focus on. I mean, your letter's great, Laura, and, and we'll make that language stronger and we'll put that out to the press and other platforms. But what we do for our, our businesses, I think needs to look a little different because we we want, yeah. I, I, I don't have an, a problem. I don't, if I recall the draft letter that I put together, there was not any idea of Maybe it's time that when your patrons are coming that you ask for an ID, obviously, but you also ask for a vaccination proof or a negative mm -hmm. test, mm -hmm. such similar to what, you know, some concerts are doing, similar to what Amher Cinema is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no reason not to at least suggest that they implement it. I think it would be reasonable. Some businesses do it. Um, I, I, I think that makes sense to add as a, as a line. Um, but we may want to clarify a position, perhaps go stronger saying, you know, ask for a booster and let him decide. I think it's a great idea, um, but maybe they decide what they, what, what they want, what type of verification that they want to do. So it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to suggest they do it um, at this point. Um, but, but again, I'm... I'm I don't know whether we have to tell him fully vaccinated and boosted or simply ask for vaccination proof. So you're recommending that we make a recommendation and not a, a requirement? I, not, not, not yet. I don't, the problem is, I, I mean, as much as I would support it is how does this work for a city of 30,000 people? We're not New York, we're not 10 million people. And um, it, 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 it would have to be a... a if there was a statewide, statewide effort, it would make sense. But 30,000 with mostly people visiting from out of town, it, there's gonna to be some sort of pushback. I, I'm not, and, and on top of this, we still, we still unclear about what fully vaccinated means. So tonight, we're not gonna be able to decide. It seems that we wanna wait for CDC to, to define full vaccination as vaccinated boosted. So I would say, we. we I'm not sure we can mandate just yet, but certainly making a recommendation in both the letter that you're going to review and as part of the bullet points that Meredith is thinking of, I, I totally would support that. If I had one ask, I would ask them to renew their efforts on masking and explain why. Um, we know we know that the enthusiasm has fallen off. Of course it has, people are exhausted. We, we see it all the time, even though I agree with, Laurent, when I go other places, people aren't masked, like, certainly like they are in Northampton. Um, but the other aspect, while the other aspects of vaccination all sort themselves out, for right now, what we can do is, is impress upon people why we're asking them to be very um, vigorous in, in their enforcement of masking. Is 
So I don't hear that anybody has the appetite for a vaccine mandate um, at this time. I, I guess I'm, you know, I, I appreciate Suzanne's comment about um, why, why we want you to play a stronger role in this mass situation. And one of the reasons why we want you to do that, I'm getting really simplistic here, is that um, we want to protect the safety and health of everyone. Um, but we also, I'm just going to say it, we don't want to be in a position where we are going to have to mandate a vaccine because that's what this will lead to, right? If, if we continue down this path. And so um, I know that's a threat, but it's, it's real because we've done mandates in other places. And, and um, so, yes, first you've got to do step one for masking. And the reason why is it, it can get really worse. And when it gets worse, then we've got a mandate or then we've got to shut down. Um, and that's inevitable and we have that history. And I don't know if, if it's a threat. I don't know by reminding people, I, I don't know. I, um, I don't know how that will be perceived, but our job is to protect the health and safety of everyone, so. I don't know if this is the time to do it, but when that time comes, will we, will we do it? Are we prepared to do it? Hopefully, um, if our hospital fills up with COVID patients, the state will do it. Um, that would be the ideal situation rather than having us have to do this. Um, sure. have to do a mandate. So I'm not sure that would happen um, by any means. Um, but it would be really hard for us to do it alone. I have to believe that there are reasons why CDC has not included boosters in the vaccination definition yet. There have to be reasons why the state had such a, an involved effort at the beginning, but that type of effort is lagging now. I don't know what the discussions are behind closed doors, the reasons why or why not, um, but I believe there are reasons. Um, and it would be very difficult for us to get out ahead of either one of those. Suggesting that those reasons are not scientific necessarily. I have no idea. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if, I don't know if CDC is waiting for certain science. Um, I, I still believe they're a science-based agency. Um, and I, I don't know if it's science or politics or what it is at the state level, lack of resources, um, fatigue. Um, transition government. Transition. And I, I don't know what it, I don't know what the discussions are. I don't think they're sitting, I don't think anyone's sitting in Boston unaware of, of this rise and um, the fact that it's alarming. I, they, they see that. Um, they've responded impressively, well, somewhat impressively be previously. So I, I don't know what, what they're thinking or cooking up right now. So from a DPH um, standpoint, at a um, all boards of health meeting that I was on a couple days ago, their stance was very clear that they are um, devoting all of their efforts towards the vaccination effort. That's where change is going to happen. So it's change, change is going to happen? How are well, they going to get unvaccinated people to choose vaccination? They've, we've been there. Um, and they're devoting their resources and their efforts towards vaccination efforts. That's what was said. Then that means booster shots will be here tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, what? Yeah, it's just. Or change can happen. I don't know. <laughs> don't quote me on that. Well, um, they can strengthen certain mandates. 
about vaccine requirements. Um, there, 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 there are ways that the state can act um, that will limit where people can go and how they can behave unless they're vaccinated. I'm not saying that, that that's the correct thing to do or, or when that might happen, but that's possible for them to do that would encourage vaccination. They need political will to do that. It's an iterative process. So your, your question, Joanne, which is on the table, is, is there a will here? You know, um, you know, I only speaking for myself personally, I, I, um, I think it's something strongly that we should be considering. I don't know when the time is right to do that. And I know of the implications of it. Um, but I don't, for me personally, I, I don't think it should be off the table because we don't know what's coming. Well, I kind of think we do know what's coming in the next month when we meet. I mean, we're not gonna be in a better position and that I can say with almost 100% certainty um, that our 14 day incident rate will, will be significantly higher than it is right now, um, the second week of January. Meredith, Meredith, do you have any thoughts on, on a move to require vaccines in restaurants and bars? I think it's a wonderful strategy. Um, but being the lone wolf in Hampshire County doing it, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I wish we could get our, you know, Hampshire County community partners garner support from everyone and do it all at once. I think that would have less of an impact on our businesses. And, um, but I don't know what else, you know, what else can be done to, you know, to get on the other side of this right now. And I don't know if people will actually get vaccinated or just not come to Hampshire County if that were it, you know? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Statewide, definitely more effective, but just this one little pocket, I'm not sure. And I know we've asked this before, but are we aware of any cities and towns that have such a requirement that started to ask? maybe further to the east? I don't know. Boston doesn't, right? No. I, think so. no. I mean, if all of New York City can do it. Um, <laughs> so it's a small state, almost. Yeah, I just, uh, Lauren, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I just want to clarify when you said not on my watch, was that, was this what you were referring to? Say again. You said earlier, not on my watch. I thought you were referring to this particular discussion about mandating vaccines. No, no, no. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm be open to, to, to mandating vaccine in oh, okay. restaurants and bars. I'm sorry if I, if I said this, I, either I misspoke or I, uh, no. <laughs> I would be open to it. I, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking I, we, we're not there yet. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I just want to make sure I, I knew where the red line was. <laughs> um, so it sounds like there isn't a will uh, to do that now. Um, but could we also do it if it's not, it's not on the agenda today? It's not on the agenda today. Um, so that probably would be a good thing to put on the agenda for next time. I don't know, Meredith, uh, would you be able to do a little groundwork with our, our um, other local departments of health and see what they're thinking, mm -hmm. um, connect with them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just think that these businesses are struggling and they have been struggling for two years that this having such an order could have such um, a detrimental impact on them that, you know, we're going to see more doors close. Again, I mean, just this one small little pocket 
doing it. You know, that's what I'm really fearful of. And I know we're not supposed to necessarily take into consideration, you know, um, financial costs or, or economics when we're doing a public health order. But I mean, we have to. Yeah, I mean, I think it could go either way. I mean, there are lots of people who are not eating in restaurants now who might be more willing to go uh, if people are vaccinated or vaccinated and boosted. Um, so it's hard to know. Uh, and maybe for different restaurants or different bars, it would work different ways depending on their crowd. Um, but I, I don't think it's clear which way that would will go. I mean, I have family in New York and they're like, I'm okay going to a restaurant because I know everyone in there is vaccinated. Yeah. Um, so I think it actually normalizes life more. And I think their businesses are thriving because of it. Um, I don't, can't say that would be true of every business. I don't know. Um, but I, I agree. I've heard that argument of, um, I'd be more comfortable if I knew everyone is vaccinated in that restaurant. I think some there are a few things that I knew. There's a variant that's slowly making its way, and there's the issue of the booster because now it seems that you know full vaccination is not enough. You need a booster. So, I think people are starting to make a different calculation. And this calculation, I don't know if we figured out yet what it is, which is why I'm tempted to say let's give it ourselves. Let's give put it on the agenda next month. Let's see what people are doing, and perhaps impose it in January, maybe do a little bit of homework, you know, trying to figure out whether business would be in favor of this or it would, they would be strongly against it because it would hurt them. And maybe if we have it on the agenda, we would have some public comment next month with business owners saying, yes, we'd like this or no, we don't want to have this. I think uh, we'll have a lot more information in a month. Uh, it seems like a long time to go without, uh, without intervening. But um, I think we'll know a lot more about Omicron. We'll know a lot more about vaccine. We'll not know a lot more about um, definition of vaccination. I, I, I suspect CDC is gonna change that, but um, okay. And if I could just, um, just one more thing. I, I don't know if there's a list of, I, I have a category, but I don't even know if it's an accurate one, Meredith, that says uh, something, the fact that lists you, I mean, a, a list of things you can do right now in your business to prevent vaccine, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know what a restaurant could do right now or what a bar could do right now. But if there are some actions that could be taken, mm -hmm. and I know it puts the onus um, on the proprietor, but the more attention focused on this, um, I think the better off we'll be. So, mm -hmm. They could add HEPA filters to their establishment. Or, you know, standing around or the seat situation. I, I, I don't even know what those lists might be. But once I see people in restaurants when I go to pick up food and once you're sitting down, that's like, okay, the mask is off. And now I can, you know, <laughs> because I'm gonna eat any second. And um, I, I don't know how to get around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the filters, the filters too, Joanne is another. I mean, that's a relatively easy thing to do that would make a place safer. Um, Yeah, it becomes an advertisement. We do, we have a filter, we have this, we do this, we do, you know. There are some stores in town that their mask sign is like, don't you even think about coming in here. Now, you know, you're not, <laughs> you know, it's almost like you're not welcome here if you don't wear a mask. So I don't know what strategies work or, or don't work. Like Suzanne said, behavior is um, um, sort of entrenched right now. But we also know this is a whole new time, something we haven't dealt with in our lifetime, so. This is not new information. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I don't know how many people are getting vaccines because it just seems like, okay, I guess I better do this. I, 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 don't, know. I, don't, I don't know. And I don't know how many people are having booster fatigue. I, I don't know. I have no idea. All of it. <laughs> yeah. All of it. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's overwhelming. Yeah. All right, any other um, comments or discussion on vaccination documentation or thoughts about requirements? I think we're, sounds like we're done with that discussion. Um, minutes, are we ready to look at minutes? We have minutes from November and December. I had one question when I was looking through the minutes um, about, did we say, um, where am I looking for minutes from December about the senior center? Did we say that we had a motion to craft language to mandate a vaccine at the senior center with or without an option for a negative PCR test? Did we say that? Not that we finally, not, not that it ended up in our final version, but was that something that was in our original proposal? Does anyone remember? I don't recall that. Because that's what's written in the minutes, but I, I wasn't sure about that. We could just take that phrase out. Anybody else? This is in um, the minute, the November minutes or the December ones? Uh, actually, is that November? I have all my papers messed up. Um, it was Roman numeral three, new business, senior center vaccine requirement. Hmm. Where is that? That was November. Was that November? Yeah, November, oh, gotcha. second page. The second paragraph under new business number three was the motion. So I would propose that we just take out that comment that says with or without an option for a negative PCR, because I just don't remember that. And it doesn't really matter because we ended up crafting the language, how we crafted it. But um, any other comments about, let's start with the, December, the November minutes. Any other comments about these minutes? Suzanne had some comments that were not included in the one I sent out. She sent me her comments. Do you have those? Do you want to go through those? Yep, I can. Let me see if I can bring them up on my screen. Suzanne, are those available to you? Do you want to go through them verbally? Um, I would have to go back and find the document that I sent Kelly. I I remember, and, and and it's um, this is not formatted to show to to track changes. Oh, yes, it is. There it is. There it is. Um, well, this is easy. Um, so the so you, um, you the red is, is the red is Suzanne's comments. Okay, it it had to do. I I I was attempting to clarify some of the language about the collective bargaining. That there are units mm -hmm. that require collective bargaining, and any um, requirement would need to be addressed through collective bar bargaining. That, I, that was what I was trying to clarify. Yeah, I think that's more clear. I think that's good. Okay. And uh, also that um, I tried to clarify some language about the, about, about the mayor, um, about the mayor avoiding 
any additional nominations or appointments um, since since the election. Putting that in the hands of the mayor elect. I only have one comment a little further down in the text, so we can take the with or without an option. Mm -hmm. Let's say, or we say motion passed three zero, Dr. Smith says a no, would that make it a three dash one? Or we could make three, four, one against, because I don't know what the zero means, whether it's an abstention or- It should be one. Yeah. Okay. And so what's down there in yellow and later? The yeah, part of my screaming. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was unclear. I, I did that just so it stood out for Kelly. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was not clear. There, it, there was a mention of two different school committees. And I did not think that the differences between them um, were, were clear in the minutes. And I don't have that information. Oh, we should, maybe we should take the word. Oh, it's the health advi advisor, advisory. That makes sense. Yeah. There's a school committee and a school health advisory committee. And then there's discussion Great. about the school committee. And um, I just, I think that needs to be clarified. Or I just say it's a school health advisory subcommittee because it's, I believe it's a subcommittee mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of it's the not. school committee. Oh, it's it's not, it's not. Okay. Um, so the way we could do this is an, uh, we could call, uh, the school committee is the school committee. It's elected mm -hmm. people that are not usually, uh, they're not city employees, right? Um, the a school health advisory committee, we could add an abbreviation, they call it the SHAC, right? So you put CH um, an abbreviation, and right. that is composed of people like the superintendent, Meredith, and so on. So we could say, uh, Director O'Leary sits on the SHAC. Why do we need that information? Well, because it's relevant, because she advises, she essentially advises the superintendent. So instead of saying sits on the committee, it should be sits on the shack. And you also strike out committee. Sits on the shack, I got that. Mm -hmm. And they agree that any mandate would have to be administratively feasible and not result in appropriate sharing of confidential medical... That makes sense. So they mm -hmm. came back and they say, we think that uh, the, the superintendent said, I talked with the shack and we want to make sure that mm -hmm. um, we, we have some degree of confidential, uh, well, the, that we, we do not share the vaccination status of people. Sim simply say whether they're compliant or not compliant. And that compliance is achieved through either vaccination or demonstrating that you have a religious or medical exemption. So that was the point. I think that's otherwise that's fine. But I, you know, Susan, if you think it's still not clear, we can we can. No, that helps a lot, Lauren. That that helps. I I was getting lost in my school committees, and, and I don't have children, so it's it was just no, I completely. Oh, because you're clarifying it as the shack, and that Meredith sits on the shack. That's helpful. Meredith, you do shit on you do you do sit on the shack. <laughs> it does. That, that was a great step. Um, I I will now go away with the um, with a, a, a visual visual of Meredith sitting on the shack. <laughs> Can't unsee that one. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was that was locked in now. All right, on the top of the next page, I actually think the word both is appropriate there instead of either. Um, they are both within 1.5 mile, miles of walking distance. Um, uh, they're, they're both within, I thought the residences were within 1.5 miles of walking distance of, of either site. Oh. Well, I, I don't see. know how you can, I'm not within 
They're both within 1.5 miles of most residences. Oh, I see what you mean. I, th I think the residents. We should the turn the sentence around. Are, are close, are within 1.5 of, of one of them. I see. We should turn the sentence around. And that all most residences are within 1.5 miles of either the Elks or the municipal vaccine location. That's I agree. Right. That's right. That's okay. Right. Um, any other comments? Um, do we want to take a vote? Is there a, a motion about these minutes with um, um, changes? I move to approve with the edits. Right here, second. Uh, second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Um, Lauren, did you want to have a comment? Oh, it just should be either the Elks or the municipal office. Right. That's my or. only comment. Yeah, Elks or. There you go. And otherwise, uh, Good. Right. So, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, okay. Uh, all in favor of approving the November 23rd minutes with uh, edits we just reviewed. Um, all in favor? Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Great. Thank you. And let's do December minutes. December minutes are brief. Um, any, uh, did anyone have any other comments about the December minutes? I, I had one question. Um, yeah. it, uh, I don't have them right up in front, but it, they're, they're on the screen. Okay. Uh, we still see the November minutes. Oh, you want to unshare and then share again? Well, to, to introduce it, it had to do with, um, what we voted on um, for the vaccine requirements. And I thought that there were exceptions to the requirements and I didn't see those reflected. It's under uh, 2A. What were the exceptions? The public events, the... Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, there are exceptions, I recall. So you just want to add a sentence that said uh, there are certain exceptions. Yeah, the mandate. I think the mandate has that language in it, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. I, would, I would just add that language. It says farmers markets, brown bags, and there's a third one. Uh, oh, municipal voting. I, Did we add contractors? Contractors, or we just took contractors out? Yeah. To contractors out. I would just add a sentence that says, you know, uh, there are certain exceptions. Just make it vague like that. Fine. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Uh, yes, my last name is misspelled uh, on the screen line, third line. Oops, on part one. Part one, third line. Your name is misspelled? I fix it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else? Sorry, Lauren. No worries. Anything else? It. Did you all get the order to sign it? <clears throat> I think I saw it when I came home tonight. So just a, a quick question about Meredith. I got the order, signed it, and then the policy came out before the signature. Does that make sense? I uh, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, you're talking about the vaccine mandate for the senior center? Yeah. Yeah, I um, signed it and then I got an email from um, uh, one of the individuals um, uh, who testified and said, oh yeah, I, I, uh, I got a copy of it from our city councilor and he mm -hmm. attached the copy of the, the order. 
Mm-hmm. And I hadn't even I hadn't even signed it at that point. Yeah, that's okay. So because um, it, it, often as soon as you guys vote on an order, we put it on the okay. website so people okay. can refer to it. But then we have the final copy once signed to go up there and replace it. Okay, thanks for telling me because I wasn't sure what was going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Meredith, just a, a, a clarification: I sign it even though I abstained. Oh, good point. I don't oh, know. I don't think you sign it. If you didn't vote for it. I abstain. Oh, that's I'll, an interesting. I'll, I'll hold off till you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. I'll ask Attorney Seawald. Thank you. Just let me know. I'm happy. Well, the, yeah, I would think yes, you do because the order passed. Hmm. Right, because uh, right, you abstain the order, but you voted against the idea. Mm-hmm. Right. Correct. Yeah. The order. yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But I'll double check with Ellen tomorrow. Just, just let. I'll, I'll yeah. sign it as soon as you let me know. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so we will put. Um, vaccination for bar uh, eating establishments on our agenda next time mm-hmm. um i'd like to have a COVID update and also include our old um orders of the indoor mask mandate and the senior center um on as old business with the um, question of definition of vaccination in particular for the senior center um any thoughts about moving the January meeting up at least a week? I think um, that would bring it. What did you say? The 20th, it was scheduled. Yeah. It was scheduled the third Thursday is the 20th. Do you want to do this sort of the 13th? Mm-hmm. I could do it the 13th. I can do it the 13th. Lauren, 13th? 13th is fine. Okay, we'll move it up to the 13th. Did you guys vote on the December minutes? Um, we just talked about it. Uh, anyone in favor of uh, the December minutes as edited? Well, we Anyone need to make a make motion. A proposal? Yeah. Uh, move, move to approve the uh, December minutes as edited. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, keeping us honest. Um, Okay, so the next meeting would be the 13th of January at 530. Um, And Kelly, can we, um, can you bring next time a list of the third Thursdays of the month and or send that out ahead of time so that we can all look and see what works if there are any dates that don't work that we would need to move. Wasn't it attached with the document? You saw that? Yeah, Yeah, she did attach it. You did attach it. I you didn't want, see that. Uh, Board of Health meeting schedule is a Word document. Attached With the agenda. The, really? I did not see that. There were like three attachments, I think. To the, uh, no, I only saw two. Oh. oh. Meeting documents. Here they are. Huh. Well, I'll go. I'll go look at them. Um. So for next time, if everybody can bring, if they have dates they could not do, and we'll see if if we need to change any of those dates ahead of time, uh, knowing that everybody doesn't know vacations and all that right now. Um, oh, I'll find that. Thank you. Let's put that as a old business, as a meeting schedule. Anything else for the next meeting? All right. It will be interesting. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, have a good holiday. Be safe. Yes, definitely. You You all too. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. We need a we need a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Well, thanks, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to hit end. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Oh, second. second. Oh. Any discussion? Oh, Laurent got it. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. yes. Laurent? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Suzanne. It is 727. Thank you all.